Gentlemen, um, tonight is a somewhat diplomatic uh, incident or occasion, but um, as I came through the door, Marion said to me, when you're about to start, just tell them to turn down the music. And music and presidents and universities has a precedent because myself and Mary were in Fordham in New York a number of years ago when Mary was president, and I was in a different role representing the United Kingdom. And we were there together, and uh, the president was the speaker at Fordham's graduation. And as we left the stage, and having had the president of Fordham talk about the reconciliation between the United Kingdom and Ireland, and how wonderful it was to have uh, two people from the island of Ireland, one representing Ireland, one representing the United Kingdom, and we left uh, the stage, and Mary looked back and said, do you hear what they're playing, Francis? And let me put it to you this way, it wasn't a tune that would foster reconciliation on the <laughs> island of Ireland. <laughs> At which point the president of Fordham, even to this day, every time I see him, he says, I was mortified, we didn't know what the tune was. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a good evening, and a very warm welcome to those of you who are coming in as visitors this evening to St. Mary's. You're very welcome uh, to this special event. I have the great pleasure of introducing the former President of Ireland, Professor Mary McAleese, who tonight will be in conversation with Dr. Sinead McInerney, the Programme Director for History here at St. Mary's. Sinead holds her PhD from the National University of Ireland, Maynooth, and joined the history team in 2010 as a lecturer in US history. In what has been billed as a fireside chat without the fire, Mary and Sinead will be addressing a century of Irish and British relations, which might have more than enough of its own heat. Now, I don't know if Mary and Sinead will have, will have time to cover a century's worth of history this evening, but I can think of no one better to give you a guided tour of the last hundred years of relations between two great states. Many of you will now be familiar with Mary's background, but for those of you who may not know, she is a seminal inspirational figure who has been central to relations between the United Kingdom and Ireland over the last 20 years, serving as the eighth president of Ireland from 1997 to 2011. Many of us in Northern Ireland took immense pride in 1997 as Mary was the first president to come from Northern Ireland and throughout her tenure played a crucial role, along with her husband, Martin, in building bridges between divided communities in Northern Ireland. Few people can claim to have has had as central a role in the peace process as Mary. She is a member of the Inn of Court of Northern Ireland and the Irish Bar, a former Reed Professor of Criminal Law and Criminology at Trinity College Dublin, and was director of the Institute of Professional Legal Studies and the first female pro-vice-chancellor at Queen's University in Belfast. Since her second presidential term ended in 2011, she has been a visiting professor at Boston College and Notre Dame University in the United States. Her appointment to St. Mary's is her first appointment at a London university. At the end of February this year, Mary gave a major address on diplomatic relations between Britain and Ireland over the past century to mark 100 years since the Easter Rising. To an audience of MPs and peers at the Palace of Westminster, she gave a very moving speech about the fraught relationship between Britain and Ireland for much of the 20th century, in which she described how relations between the two countries have been transformed over the course of that 100 years. As well as covering the Easter Rising, Mary spoke about the troubles in Northern Ireland, 
the long path to peace and improving Anglo-Irish relations, which culminated in the visit of Her Majesty the Queen to Ireland in 2011. Mary also referred to Ireland and Britain's entry into the European Union on the same day in 1973, and how this led to closer political and diplomatic ties between the two states. This is of particular relevance today as we prepare for the vote on the 23rd of June. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure that Mary and Sinead will touch on some of these topics, and I certainly don't want to steal your thunder. So without further ado, over to Sinead and Mary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chancellor, for your kind uh, introduction. Um, and you're absolutely right. We will cover, hopefully, many of these things as we uh, talk today. Um, let me also extend my thanks to um, Professor McAleese for uh, agreeing to talk to staff and students here at St Mary's, but also particularly my history students, uh, many of whom I see are here already uh, today, and um, some of whom are undergraduates, some of whom are taking the MA in public history, um, students also from the MA in Irish Studies, which is run through the Centre uh, for Irish Studies here at St Mary's. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk to all of these uh, very eager students um, and hopefully they'll have lots of questions for you towards the end. Um, we will talk about lots of different things today, including commemorations, hopefully, um, some of these things that, Fra that Francis talked about, um, starting with 1916 and maybe going all the way through to a discussion on possibly uh, the, the outcome of this vote um, in, uh, in the summertime. Um, so maybe we could uh, start, thank you, maybe we could start with um, uh, your involvement in the commemorations in uh, Dublin on Easter weekend, uh, the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. Um, you were at the commemoration, the main commemorative event outside of the GPO, um, alongside former President Mary Robinson um, and Martin McGuinness, uh, Deputy, De Deputy First Minister of um, Northern Ireland. I'm just wondering whether you can talk us through your perspectives on that day, and particularly um, for uh, many of my history students are interested in commemoration and remembering, the act of remembering. So I'm just wondering whether you can talk us through um, what, what you observed that day, your own involvement in the day, and wh what you think really about these kinds of events within the fabric of Anglo-Irish relations? Are they useful for mending old wounds or do they cause or do they provoke us to think differently about relationships? Well, my, my involvement with um, the 100th anniversary of the Rising, which was commemorated on Easter Sunday, um, and of course, Easter being a movable feast, it has been the tradition in Ireland always to nonetheless commemorate it on whatever happens to be Easter Sunday, um, though it actually happened on Easter Monday, but you know, typical Irish, but anyway, we celebrated on Easter Sunday, <laughs> just to confuse everybody, and um, so my, my involvement on the day really involved just turning up and being there for the commemoration and having the very privileged um, position of sitting effectively in the front row, um, it's one of the penalties of spending 14 years in office, um, that um, it was a, just a, a, very, a very interesting place to be on that day, to be able to catch the mood. And I was aware that very often dignitaries don't necessarily catch the whole mood, you know. So I took sign things from my kids who were in most, much less lugubrious places, you know, um, sort of shimmed up, shimmed up um, lampposts near Trinity College and such. Um, among the among the, the the people of the t of the city, and people who have come from all over Ireland, I think on as I reflect back on that that day, it was a very respectful, dignified, inclusive, very happy day, actually for you know for, to be commemorating something that was so serious and so convulsive and cathartic, um, and that you know over a period of a week took the lives of um, just under 500 people and then you know led in turn to the war of independence and civil war and uh, and ultimately then um, independence for part of Ireland um, but not the part that I was born in um, I thought on the day that if you could do commemoration without um, without jingoism without triumphalism without <coughs> militarism um, without hurt 
without um, taking the, you know, the taking the, the the knife and turning it in the wound. That was how to do it. I thought it was done beautifully, and I think most people who were there, almost everybody who was there, if not everybody who was there, would have, I think felt the same, including people who were there as mere spectators or observers from other traditions. Um, I'm very caught by the remarks of the brother of the uh, Westminster MP, Geoffrey Donaldson, who's a member of the British military and was there in that capacity. He has a role, I can't remember exactly what role, in relation to the commemoration of the Great War. So in that role he was there at the GPO on Easter Sunday a few weeks ago and he described it in very beautiful terms. <laughs> and even though the army, you know, they're, they're, I mean, obviously the the, the nature of the parade was that we had um, the, the army, the navy and the air corps. They're very small in Ireland, as you can imagine, but they have a very distinguished history in UN service for a nation that is uh, militarily neutral, but not unengaged with the problems of the world, very much engaged in peacekeeping. And to see the, you know, the, um, the blue beret of the United Nations going past so frequently, to see then um, all the first responders all commemorated in, in whatever role, including um, professional and amateur first responders, uh, I thought that was very respectful. And it was, you know, it was a nation that has a tradition now of military neutrality that came out of suffering, suffering of violence over many, many centuries in a decision, we're small, what can we bring to the world, what charism can we bring to the world? And one of the charisms is um, a strong opposition to violence from the very beginning of the state, which is interesting. Mm. That as soon as the rising was over, as soon as the, well, as soon as the, making part of the Civil War was over and the state was created, the, the mood was, now we're about building democracy in peace. And we're going to distill the Irish experience. And one, out of that distillation has come a culture of military neutrality, um, which I think is a very important kind of message in a world that you know, for which the default position so often <coughs> tends to be aggressive response. Okay, well you, you talked about the um, uh, commemoration of the, uh, the, the First World War, the Great War, mm -hmm. and um, you just mentioned that there. So let me just pick up on that. Um, when the Irish government were planning the nature of the celebrations, um, there was quite a lot of talk about inc inclusivity and how to balance the interests of um, people who had um, who felt very strongly about the Republic and the importance of the Republic and the establishment of the Republic through the Rising, and also those from uh, other political positions, um, uh, particularly those who fought on, on, for, for the British army in the Great War. Um, and we haven't been great as a nation in remembering the Irish uh, involvement in the Great War. We are but now, I think. We are much better now. I think yeah. we're much better at it. We have changed that. Mm. I think we've changed the trajectory of that narrative. In a way, look, you can understand why. It's 100 years on from 1916. 1916 occurred right in the middle of the Great War. Um, at the start of the Great War in 1914, um, Ireland was on the brink of civil war. And it was on the brink of civil war because of the, the, the fragmentation and the tensions that had been caused by the home rule debate. That home rule debate had been carried out, you know, through political discourse and political pressure in constitutional ways by the Irish Parliamentary Party in Parliament. But it had provoked um, that, 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 that both the political and the sectarian tensions between North and South that had caused the formation um, by Sir Edward Carson, among others, of the Ulster Volunteers. These were a militia, an unlawful, illegal militia, paramilitary force, who threatened the British government that they would set up their own government mm. in Northern Ireland. So, and then, of course, in response to that, we had the formation you know, of the Irish Volunteers on the nationalist side. So things, the, the tensions around that were, were really rather stark and very scary um, until the interruption of the, of the Great War put that aside. And it gave a kind of an opportunity for redemption to the Carsonites because they were able to offer themselves then. They, they transformed themselves essentially into 36th Ulster Division, which fought gallantly at the Somme, mm. of great memory at Messine, um, lost so many um, 
good people. And the Irish volunteers then, um, here was another militia, and along comes John Redmond, the great champion in Parliament of Home Rule, and he says, look, if you join the British Army, which was no big deal really for Irish people at that time, there was a huge history of involvement of the Irish in, I mean, we were part of the empire at the time, there was a huge involvement mm. of the Irish in the British Army. Mm. You only have to look at two, two, of the signatory, two of the signatories of the proclamation, you know, um, uh, had Tom, Tom Clark, who actually, I suppose, in a way, is the author of the Rising, born in Hampshire to a father who was a sergeant in the British Army. Um, James Connolly, James Connolly served for seven years in the British Army, where? In Ireland. You know, so, you know, that's two of the seven signatories. You know, it's a pretty interesting, it's a pretty mm -hmm. interesting statistic. So joining the British Army, many, many, many people in Ireland had family members and history of family members, the British Army. At one point towards the end of the 19th century, I think about 40% of the foot soldiers in the British Army were Irish. So that was not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And there was, um, as you know, at the early part of the war, there was no conscription. It was all voluntary, both in England and in Ireland. And so Redmond said, look, join up. If you join up, if you join the British Army as a volunteer, you will be rewarded with the gift of, of home rule. So 200,000 people from the island of Ireland, you know, a very small population, joined up. Um, by the end of the war, there's arguments, all sorts of arguments about how many died, but I've seen stats that run from 25,000 to 50,000. Mm. I think John Horne, whose view on this I tend to accept, is probably around the 35,000 mark. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And um, I mean, in the, in the month before the rising, um, in one day and one battle, um, almost the entire 16th Irish division were wiped out. Mm. So. Um, that was the, you know, that's the context. Mm. That's where it's, you know, so joining the British Army was no big deal, but unfortunately um, th there was an expectation. Ireland was a member of the British Empire, part of the British Empire, the, the, <laughs> the first colony, um, the first English colony. Um, and the expectation of empire was that all subjects in the empire, and bear in mind that almost a quarter of the world's people, the world's citizens, were subject to the British Empire at that time. It was the biggest empire in the world. Um, what, what have we got? A, a population of just under half a billion yeah. uh, distributed right across the world. And the, the, the ethic, if you like, or the culture of empire, certainly the law of empire, was that you owed it loyalty. And fealty to empire was a very important late motif, with the result that when the men of the rising uh, and when Irish nationalism generally ultimately supported the idea of independence, but particularly when the rising happened in the middle of a war involving the interests of the British Empire, there was on one side of the equation in Ireland a very strong belief that this behaviour was treacherous, that you were breaking this law of fealty and fidelity. But of course what they had missed and never really truly probed was the other undercurrent in Ireland that had been there and growing for centuries, which was, we owe no allegiance to the empire. Empires are of their nature not entitled to call on our allegiance. Um, empires gain what they gain by marching in and taking. They take that which does not belong to them. They take your sovereignty and they take your dignity. And the, the rising was about rebelling against the taking of that sovereignty, that dignity, that innate uh, indefeasible right to control your nation's own <coughs> destiny. That's how they would have seen it. So here on the one hand, you had the rising characterized by some as an act of treachery, others as an act you know, of noble patriotism. And both sides arguing about what was actually patriotic here. And then you had the very, in my view, very foolish response of the British to the rising in terms of how they handled the deaths, uh, the executions of the leaders of the rising. That was never going to, it was never going to help the temper of the time in a very short period, but strung out over a period from, from the beginning of May, actually really until the end of, until the trial of Sir Roger Casement in August. You had this the, you know, the, these um, summary executions of who were men who were actually very good and valiant men and decent people in many, many ways. And that, that, the cruelty of that was 
definitely going to leach down into that subterranean world where conversations about nationalism, identity, and anti-imperialism had, had gone on. It was going to pump up that. Then at the same time, you had Irish nationalists <coughs> fighting, you know, in Flanders, fighting at the Somme, wondering to themselves, where should we be? Should we be at home fighting? Or should we be here fighting? They're in British Army uniform. Um, then they come home, some of them, you know, they come home and they are now regarded as traitors who didn't come to help the fight for Ireland. So it all gets terribly unglued and complicated. In families, people fall out over allegiance, identity. And although we have perhaps to some extent exaggerated the, um, I think maybe exaggerated the fallout in the sense that, you know, part of the, the myth that has grown up is that Ireland never certainly in the, in the Republic, never commemorated the sacrifice of those who died at the Somme and elsewhere, Gallipoli or wherever. That's actually not true. I mean, we, had this, we have this beautiful memorial yeah. garden that was built not too terribly long after the war, um, but did fall into kind of disuse um, um, with the growth of the new state. So that by the time I was growing up in Northern Ireland, I grew up in Belfast, you know, you had a bunch of old soldiers hanging around street corners in my in my area, and I knew I grew up in a Protestant area, and I knew very well how important the cenotaph was, how important the memory of war was, and how the story was that only Ulster had been faithful mm. to the empire, only Ulster had stood by little Belgium only Ulster, and that there was this great act of treachery, meanwhile, in the Republic at a time when the empire was under pressure and standing up for rights and values. And here along come these boys, um, and they have the rising, they, you know, they bite, uh, they stab Britain in the back. So all of that um, conduced to a situation where by the time I was growing up, really, the memory of those who, on the nationalist side, who were by far the biggest number who had volunteered um, in British uniform and served in British uniform, their memory was, in a memorable phrase, that somebody from, um, somebody, I, I, th I think it was a Dublin Fusilier gave me the phrase uh, that's been used and used time and time again, their memories were now in shoe boxes in mm. the attic. Mm. They were forgotten, they were dust laden. Um, People didn't talk about them. You didn't talk about your granddad or your uncle who died in the war First World War in British uniform or somebody who had come back and you didn't talk about them. Mm. And I, growing up, particularly whenever I came into the presidency, but in fact before I became, came into the presidency in 1997, I knew this story was being ransacked for all the wrong reasons. That we had this landscape of history littered with fact, but we were picking over its bones just for the bits that supported our own version of history. And in the doing of that, we were actually disrespecting the memory of people who had gone off to war for whatever their motivation and had, had, had put their lives on the line. And these were Irish men and they had broken hearts at homes, they had wives and mothers and sweethearts whose lives were completely decimated, who had to live their futures without them or with them shell-shocked or, mm. or worse still, looked down upon. And we had to redeem that somehow. It seemed to me there's a moral case for the redemption of that and the bringing back of that into memory and the commemoration in a respectful way. But I also could see that beyond that, that if we could do that, if we could bring the, that story into right alignment and we could point out to Northern, Northern Unionists the extraordinary sacrifice that was made by people south of the border, most of whom were Irish Catholic nationalists, um, and if we could say to Irish Catholic nationalists, you shared this sacrifice with you know, Ulster's Protestant Unionists, you stood together at Messines, you know, the 16th Irish and the 36th Ulster were all blown to pieces together at Messine, and they stood shoulder to shoulder. If we could tap into that, that we would release into the Ireland of today something, a kind of a, not just a new perspective, but a new platform that people could stand on safely but together mm. in a way they never had been together before. And so in 1998, I went with Her Majesty the Queen to Messine. 
to inaugurate the first ever uh, joint. It was a, an island of Ireland peace park, it's called, with a beautiful round tower um, in that flat Belgian landscape. It's very stark. Um, and that was a very moving occasion. And I think that that really, and, and a huge amount of work had gone into that before by people from both traditions who could see the need to do this, mm. the righteousness of it, but also the investment in the future. And I think that, so we have recalibrated that story. And in fairness to the Irish government, in 2006, when we hit the 90th anniversary of the rising, having for the best part of 20 years before not commemorated East, the Easter Rising because of the troubles in Northern Ireland and, if you like, the, the ownership or the attempted ownership of the Rising uh, by, um, by those um, in um, the IRA um, and not wanting to be associated with that. And there are views as to whether that was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. But anyway, the, com the, the, the commemoration stopped for a very long period. But in, 20, in 2006, and um, here I did have a hand actor part, in the, the process that led to uh, the decision to recommemorate. But on the basis that, not only would we introduce a new commemoration of the rising, we would inaugurate the first official commemoration of the Psalm. Right. So that happened in the same year. And that was a very important statement about inclusion, about all these people being part of our history, entitled to their space and entitled to respect. And we'll do that again this year. Now, having had the rising anniversary, uh, we will, in July, have an official commemoration for the 100th anniversary of the psalm. Right. And that will be a shared commemoration. One of the things, just to, to complete the story about how, just how remarkable the transformation is, when Her Majesty the Queen came to Ireland in, 20, in May of 2011, among the places she visited uh, was the now, you know, spit and polished up um, a garden, uh, the, the memorial gardens at Island Bridge, which were set up um, to commemorate. They're very, very beautiful on the banks mm. of the Liffey. A magnificent space uh, dedicated to the memory of those who died in British uniform in the First World War. And she visited there. And the people who came to that memorial, among the people who came, were former paramilitaries from both sides. And they stood there shoulder to shoulder. And that just struck me as, yes, we've achieved a shared platform. We have stopped, at least in one chapter of Irish history, we have stopped ransacking that chapter of history in order, rather perversely, to separate us. And you can only do that by telling lies about it. And now we tell the truth about it, and it unites us. And on the same visit, uh, the Queen also visited the uh, Garden of Remembrance. She did. Um, and that, I presume that was a deliberate uh, attempt to try and um, highlight the shared um, experiences. Absolutely. It was a really extraordinary thing. I mean, you have to think, you really just have to stop and think about this visit, you know, in a, in a, because of the, the, the presence of 1916 in that visit was everywhere, mm. in the iconography of the visit. She came to Ireland, bear in mind that no monarch, no uh, British monarch had stood in Dublin since 1911, since her grandfather George V had come on his accession tour of Ireland um, as, you know, uh, king of, um, uh, king of Ireland essentially, um, emperor of India, you know, and well he was, he would have been called king of the United Kingdom, of course he'd been the king of the United Kingdom time so fine so he came in 1911 and nobody had been back to Dublin since for you know for political reasons so she flew into casement aerodrome right? that's where her plane landed so who is casement aerodrome named after Sir Roger casement who had been of course a British diplomat um, uh, recognised and honoured uh, with a knighthood by the British for the way in which he revealed the evil nature of the Belgian Empire, particularly in the Congo, and then hanged by the same British for his service to his own country, which was Ireland, uh, when he took part in essentially in trying to arm the rising. And he was hanged in Pentonville um, later in 1916. So you know, 
The British will take a, a different view of Casement from the Irish. I mean, he's one of my great heroes, and um, I, can, I can almost not bear to even talk about him. I find it just so awful uh, that we would have, you know, that such a wonderful human being could have been so destroyed. Um, so she arrives into that iconographic mm. named place. And the first place she visited, the first, was the Garden of Remembrance, not to be confused with the Memorial Garden at Island Bridge, other side of the Liffey. The Garden of Remembrance is dedicated to one group of people. There's nothing inclusive about it. It is dedicated to the memory of all those who over the centuries dedicated their lives to ending British rule in Ireland. Unequivocal, that's what it exists to do. We have other memorials that include everybody. This one does not. Um, and it is also, importantly, the why was it chosen as the Garden of Remembrance? Well, it was chosen because that was the place where the, those who were involved in the Rising were rounded up and marched from there to Kilmainham to their deaths. So again, a place of incredible, um, deep and rooted memory. And she went there, the very first place she visited, and uh, she and I were together and she walked up and she laid a wreath. And then she did something that just wasn't in the script. It just wasn't in the script. And it showed me the power of simple things. Um, rather than words, uh, she just nodded her head. Just a very simple nod of the head. And in the doing of that, I'm absolutely morally certain uh, that she melted hearts that were hardened against the British and British monarchy and British Empire and the history of the British in Ireland and were antipathetic to the British. Um, um, she melted hearts all over Ireland in, doing of that, in the doing of that. That simple gesture of respect um, so, you know, that laid, in a way that helped lay the foundation for what we experienced then in um, a month ago, or less than a month mm. ago, a few weeks ago, on the day of the rising, when a lot of people felt released from, I'd say, more, the more toxic hold of history, mm. uh, because they knew that we're neighbours, Ireland and Britain. Ireland's not going anywhere, Britain's not going anywhere. We probably have wished that we would all go somewhere else over years, but we are not going anywhere. And I have to say, I'm a very, I've always been a very pragmatic person. Um, um, and part of that pragmatism has always insisted to me that if you are going to be living beside people, there's always a realm of interdependency that is essential. You know, it goes back to the no man is an island. If we're neighbours, there's a level of extraordinary dependency and it's evidence the number of Irish people who are here in Britain, the number of British who are here in Ireland, the shared history, shared geography, shared architecture, shared but contested often, you know, but nonetheless neighbours. And if you're going to, if we are going to be interdependent and if we're always going to be neighbours to each other, it strikes me it's an awful lot better and healthier and more humanly decent if we are good neighbours to each other. And one of the great things today is, to, you know, to hear Her Majesty the Queen during her speech when President Higgins made the return state visit to Windsor, or to England, but uh, at a dinner in Windsor in his honour, when she said that, um, you know, that, we have, that we, what we're doing now is we're discovering we like each other. And that sounds, maybe the word like sounds a bit trite, but actually after the history we've gone through, I think it's, I would regard that as miraculous and gracious a wonderful word, um, that we do like each other. Um, and the second thing she said was that no government on earth enjoyed as good a relationship with the British government than the Irish government. Now, that's a hundred years on. It's a hundred years of, you know, chaos and mess, but it's also, in the latter part, the result of a huge effort by all sorts of people at, you know, in families, at community level, in schools and universities and academic life, historians, politicians, um, activists on all sides, um, uh, churchmen, churchwomen, lay people, all either individually and, at some, and sometimes collectively, including from outside Ireland, you know, our neighbours in the European Union who are so helpful, our friends in the United States who are so helpful, just 
trying to reach that we like each other space that we knew was all was there, but we just couldn't find, we couldn't find the conduit to get it out. And we got it with the Good Friday Agreement. Um, if we can turn to the Good Friday Agreement. Yesterday was the 18th anniversary of the signing of I the know. Good Friday Agreement. <laughs> um, <coughs> so do I. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wonder, could you talk to us a little bit about um, your perspectives on the successes of the Good Friday Agreement? So 18 years, 20 years after the fact, um, you talked when you, uh, when you took over the presidency in 1997, you talked about building bridges. So my question is, have we built all the bridges or do we still need some engineers? Uh, we, we need a lot of engineers and we certainly haven't built all the bridges, but I think we've built some quite successfully. Uh, the biggest bridge of all was the, that, that treaty. The, uh, it's an international treaty um, signed by the British government, Irish government, uh, co-sponsored essentially by the two governments and of course the the main participants and the, all the, not all the participants, the political participants in Northern Ireland at that time, you might remember that the Reverend Dr Ian Paisley's party, the DUP, stayed sheer of it, didn't want anything to do with it. But um, one of the things that always struck me about that agreement, I was doing a talk uh, earlier this week at the Oxford Literary Festival and the ambassador to, uh, from Ireland to uh, Great Britain, uh, Dan Mulhall, asked me about my memory of the day that the agreement was signed. And I said to him, actually, you know, my, my memory of that day is much vaguer than my memory of the day a short time later in May when we had the twin referenda, North and South. Because there was a kind of a nervousness and a tentativeness until we knew how much support and backing there was among the people for this historic agreement. And it could have all, I mean, for example, it could have all fallen apart if in this referendum people had said, no, no, it doesn't express what we want. And so I was actually nervous, uh, hopeful, because I always believed the yesness was there and needed to get out. But, on this, but the, you know, at the same time, you can't stand over everybody and you, know, and you can't, I, you have to let them put their own X in the ballot paper. So uh, for me, the, the most exciting day was when the, um, in May of 1998, the people of the Republic of Ireland and the people of Northern Ireland were asked to vote on the Good Friday Agreement. Because bear in mind, the people of the Republic were being asked to sign away their, the, the, the right that they set out in their constitution to the sovereignty of the entire island of Ireland. So that was a big, big ask, but it had been willingly given as part of the compromise, and there was compromise both ways, because the Unionists, of course, had lost their perpetual veto um, they had been, it, it had been conceded to them that the United King, that Northern Ireland would remain in the United Kingdom for as long as that was the will of the people of Northern Ireland. But it had also been said that from time to time, the will of the people would be tested to see that they want a United Ireland. So, so that was the, the quid pro quo, as it were. And then on that day when the people voted, and so overwhelmingly in favour of the agreement, I knew we were on solid territory now because now the backstop for all the politicians, and I knew that the future was not going to be, you know, it was not all going to be, you know, primroses and flowers, you know, and, and you know, and light, you know, happy light shining down on us. It was going to be one heck of a bumpy road. Um, because bear in mind, we still had considerable violence even in the aftermath of that, and we also had excluded from the process, well, they had excluded themselves, a massive constituency, which was the supporters of the of the um, the, the Reverend Ian Paisley, the DUP, and that, that whole, and and in back of that, uh, the, the the loyalist paramilitary tradition. So, and that had to be brought on board. I mean, we couldn't we couldn't survive unless they eventually came on board. So, but now we knew, now we knew the people support this. It is their treaty. There was now, for the first time, Protestants knew how Catholics thought, Catholics knew how Protestants thought, Unionists knew how Nationalists thought, and we all kind of thought the same. We were all prepared to compromise to create the future. That was a very important backstop. And it, that sense of solidarity, it seems to me, has consolidated over the years. It's certainly been tested a few times. And, you know, and we've been through, you know, eventually we managed to get the DUP on board with the, good, the St Andrews Agreement. Then we've had, you know, we've had ups and downs and ins and outs. And anybody who watched the, the more recent shenanigans where we had, I don't know, how many, how many times did we have people resigning of going back in and resigning of going back in to the Northern Ireland Assembly just in the last year or so? 
um, over various issues. Um, but, 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 here's the thing. In the Northern Ireland is now governed by a, it's a kind of a shotgun marriage, shotgun coalition. Um, there are a few of those around, I would say. Um, and um, there may even be more to come. And, um, uh, and so, um, in that shotgun coalition, the, the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, um, a former student of mine, incidentally, Arlene Foster, um, of whom I'm very proud, um, are, um, she heads up the DUP. Now, that party was going to have nothing to do with the Good Friday Agreement, but she's now, she's now the First Minister of Northern Ireland. And not only that, but who is she, who's her, you know, who's the, the Deputy First Minister is a member of Sinn Féin. Um, you know, um, a, a person with a history in paramilitarism, and people that the, that the DUP over their dead bodies, were they ever going to talk to them? Were they ever going to have anything to do with them? They're in government together now. Again, I regard that as just a grace-filled uh, miracle. And if there are problems, which there are, well, frankly, point me to a government that does not have problems. Um, and, you know, if there are ups and downs, that's the nature of political life. That it's there, that it is relatively stable, and possibly no less stable than a lot of other forms of government in Europe. I'm very conscious, for example, we still haven't got a, a government in the Republic of Ireland at the moment, um, and, and Spain still hasn't got a government. Um, so it's in the nature of politics today, I think, that we have, you know, there's always a fundamental undercurrent of instability, um, sort of st almost like stable instability in the settled democracies. And uh, the realm of instability is quite modest, in my view. And in Northern Ireland, I, there's not the remotest chance of going back to the days of violence. There just isn't. You, something in you tells you that. Have we solved the problem, you know, of sectarianism on the streets? Probably not. There probably are situations, I know them, you know, where kids still can't go there, here, where parents are still scared stiff, you know, about the dangers of, you know, of, of what I might call uh, sort of low-grade sectarian attack. We just had recently the problem with the killing of <coughs> Adrian Ismay, a, um, a, a, a prison officer, by um, some kind of a fragment um, that calls it, that links itself to the IRA and refuses to accept the will of the people for peace um, and has no, absolutely no public support whatsoever and will, you know, in due course be brought to heel precisely because it doesn't have the luxury of public support um, or the oxygen of public support. But you're confident that all of those things can be overcome by a fairly robust system then in Northern Ireland? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the Good Friday Agreement has been tried and tested and it's, it's a structure. I, 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 without structure, it, we'd be in a mess. I mean, I do think that the future requires the structure and the ethic and the value system that underpins it all, which is the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, it's based on parity of esteem. There are rules, there are regulations, there is, and built into the structure is, is the experience of, well, decades of failure, quite frankly. I mean, the, from, from partition to 1998, Northern Ireland and the problems of its constitutional status and what have you, are, and, and the violence, it's littered with failed efforts. You know, we can think of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, we can think of the Sunningdale, poor old Sunningdale Agreement. I mean, the Sunningdale Agreement, 19, you know, early 1970s, and then we get to the 1998, and Seamus Mallon memorably <laughs> described the, 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 the Good Friday Agreement as Sunningdale for slow learners. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the sad part of that is that in the meantime, you have 3,000 people killed um, and others maimed and hearts broken and homes destroyed and hopes destroyed. Um, so, but there's a learning curve and I honestly think that we have, in, that uh, Northern Ireland, people have climbed painfully up the learning curve and they're not going to surrender it easily. So what happens then if the vote here uh, takes England, um, and, well, takes the UK out of uh, the European Union. What happens to Northern Ireland in that uh, context? And what do you think might happen between, you know, within Anglo-Irish relations if that happens? Well, the first thing I would say about Anglo-Irish relationships is that they will remain strong because they are now, I think, inviolably strong. So I think the relationship, I mean, the political relationship and the relations will remain good. A lot of other things won't, though. 
and there are just such high risks. I mean, the stakes here are very, very high. And so um, I'm hoping and praying that sense will prevail and that membership of the European Union will continue. I think Britain is a very formidable contributor to the Union and a very necessary contributor. It brings a particular charism, a particular history, a particular attitude that is needed around the European Union table and has proved to be very, very useful. Very important as part of the ballast, the cantilevering of the experience of trying to get consensus among 28 very different countries with very, very different pasts, different perspectives, different everything, except for one thing. They had the experience, the absolutely dreadful experience of a Second World War, in which 60 million people died. That was the last century. Oh, it was a great place. Anybody who's got a nostalgia for the last century, I don't belong to the same club as you. I just think of the unnecessary industrial scale dying that was inflicted mainly, you know, mainly on young men and we think of what happened in the Holocaust and everything that was evil that was released by that dreadful war. And then a bunch of sense, a war, you know, a European war essentially. You can call it world war if we like, but a war between what? Neighbours. And then the fallout from it, you know, the tipping and the, uh, the mess afterwards, you know, of so many countries, you know, with walls and excluded through communism and uh, dictatorships and the mess of it afterwards, the abominable mess. And then a bunch of sensible people met in uh, a small town in France, in Luxeuil, in 1950, at a secret meeting. And they said, in the name of God, and it was in the name of God, are we not capable of thinking of something better than this? Are we going to be in a perpetual state of war because that's what the world looked like? First World War, it was going to end all wars and didn't. Second World War, even worse. And looking at the capacity the world was growing for killing more people more quickly than ever before and more efficiently than ever before, you know, they, they said, can we think of something better? Is it possible that we could work in partnership? Could we try and see what is it like when instead of heaving you know, against each other, we heave together and feel the full flood of power that comes from partnership? And at that secret meeting in a hotel in Luxeuil that was attended, we now know by the man who subsequently became John the Twenty-Third, no accident that he wasn't through the door five minutes when he set up the Second Vatican Council, to match the cathartic change that was necessary in political thinking to establish the idea of this extraordinary adventure that was the European Union. Um, and at that meeting you had members, uh, Ireland was represented at that meeting by I think at least four people, including Sean McBride, who it is thought spoke very, very powerfully and made a huge impact in favour of um, the development of the notion of a European Union. Um, uh, there were representatives from Britain, there were even representatives from Switzerland. There were pl places that today are outside of the process but still strongly linked to the Union. So I think of the Union as in the very first place, never let's lose sight of the fact that it is the important bastion and barricade against the gravitational pull of insanity towards war and conflict. And believe me, we are capable of it. Anybody who thinks we're not, grow up for God's sake. Because just read the history. You're all historians. Read the history of the last century. The gravitational pull of stupidity is always just lurking close by. That's the first thing. The second thing is I look at what the European Union did for British-Irish relationships. The link from 19, we joined, the, we joined on the same day as the British in 1973. Relationships between Britain and Ireland weren't great at that time. Um, they were all right, but they weren't brilliant. Um, and they would, you know, they would sort of veer from, because there was still a kind of a, you know, a, a hostility on the part of the British that we'd, you know, that we'd had the, the chutzpah to leave the empire. Um, but at the same time, there was, there was a kind of a growing, um, a kind of a growing um, 
sort of political intercourse, let's say, but there weren't very many forums in which that could be expressed. The United Nations, yes, but it wasn't really, we weren't meeting often enough and closely enough. Along came the membership of the European Union. And the best story I can give as to the impact of that on relations between Ireland and Britain is that two, very shortly after, two members of an organization called Eurofin or Ecofin, I'm not sure which is it, Eurofin or Ecofin, I don't even remember. It was the organization of European finance ministers. They met regularly. Two people met there as their country's finance ministers. One was called Albert Reynolds and the other was called John Major, two of the most underestimated men in the history of Irish-British relationships. Because we tend to focus on kind of, you know, bigger characters. These were men who were not driven by an, any form of ego. They were, they were driven by public service. And here's the thing, they really liked each other. They got on well together. And they weren't to know that they would subsequently become the prime ministers of their respective countries. And when they did, John Major was in wicked trouble in Westminster, all in terms of Irish politics, Northern Irish politics, because his numbers were such that he really was in hockey, you might say, to the Ulster Unionists. In the normal course of events, that could have caused quite considerable breakdown between Ireland and Britain as we stumbled through the, the debris of various peace processes. And it's a credit to both of them, it never happened. They talk tough to each other, God knows. I mean, their, their records of their meetings are interesting. Um, there's a lot of bad language used. And, uh, but they walked out in brotherly affection. They never broke down. And subsequent, one, of the, one of the most poignant moments for me in, in recent times was when Albert Reynolds died, was at his funeral, seeing um, John Major, who was a regular visitor to Albert over the years long after they were retired, they were great friends, and John Major sitting crying, sobbing at his funeral. And that told me just how important the human contact is. Freud said it, you know, it was Freud who said it about the, about the Second World War. It showed that neighbours can live cheek by jowl in the com most appalling ignorance of each other. You gotta work at relationships. The European Union forced us to work at relationships. We had to sit around the table, we had to work together. We got to know each other. We were the only two English speaking people, so in the pub afterwards we talked to each other. It was easier <laughs> than trying your O-level French on each other. You know, it was just humanly easier. And it kind of almost, on, almost, you know, just sort of spontaneously worked up relationships. Our civil servants got to know each other better. Our diplomats got to know each other better. We discovered, in the words of Her Majesty, that we actually liked each other. And we were able to support each other and give each other backing on certain things. But we were also respectful of the fact that we had both joined this union voluntarily, the first union that we had, Irish, had actually joined voluntarily. But we were there as volunteers. <laughs> And we respected each other's position, and we respected each other's right to be different, so, and to establish, to listen to each other. And so out of that, you know, comes, you fast forward to 1998, by the time we get to Bertie Ahern and Tony Blair, who had a, you know, a, 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 a real empathy for each other, that also was hugely important, hugely, hugely important. And again, they were, they were, uh, pragmatic people get the job done what does it need what do you need to do to get the job done well then let's get let's do that and let's do it together people they weren't people who would take a principle and die for it even if that principle you know was partly ridiculous um, I'm not saying they were unprincipled quite the reverse their ethic was our essential principle is public service and public service involves problem solving and prob the bigger the problem, the more important it is that you take the approach of how best to solve this problem. What does it take? And these were people who I think taught us how to compromise, insisted that we learn how to compromise, and they showed us how to do that in the language in which they engaged with one another. That all came out of the European Union and the engagement between Ireland and Britain. What would the Union look like without Britain? I think it would limp without it, and I think um, you know, there are 28 members, you know, would it continue with 27? Would it continue and grow and prosper? Yes, it would. But would it lose something? Oh, absolutely. Would Britain lose something by the isolation that would come as a result of that? And the not being in a position to know and deal with your neighbours every day and still, incidentally, have to have trade with them because, you know, 
was a billion, a billion euros worth of goods and services flow between Ireland and Britain every week. That's jobs. You know, that could be your mum, your dad's job, could be your job, could be, you know, could be my kids' jobs. These are very important. We want that to continue. Well, it's easy to do it when we have structures that facilitate it. After a Brexit, those structures would not be in place and we'd have to create them or not. And how long would it take to create them? That to me is all high risk. And, that, and there's no doubt that Ireland would be you know, really quite strongly impacted. And I think Irish people in Britain um, and British people in Ireland, of whom there are a significant number, and I incl include among the Irish in Britain the, the, you know, those who are born in Ireland and those who are first, second, and third generation. You know, we have a vested interest in getting this referendum right. The first thing I did when I came here, um, I, I can tell it now, and it, it was my own personal little secret until Dominic Chilcott told the entire world, the British ambassador to Ireland. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Dominic quite rightly you know, remarked the other day in Ireland that, you know, that I had told him the first thing I did when I came here to St Mary's was I registered to vote. Uh, because I regard this as just so important. And there's, you know, the, we're gonna, it's not for me to tell anybody how to vote. But I can tell you that I will be voting to stay because I believe the union is the future. Do I think that it is the council of perfection? No, I don't. I mean, it's as messy as any other politics. It's as messy as you're going to get with 28 different nations and all their vanities sitting around the table. But they have a treaty, like the Good Friday Agreement. They have a bunch of treaties. They have a bunch of structures. And that keeps things, in, that keeps things ticking over while we argue, debate. Are there things wrong with it? Of course there are. But we're, we're all there to argue the toss and get it right, or as near right as we can, to problem solve our way out by staying, like in a family, you know, stay and argue and solve. Walking away, it seems to me, is such, a, is such an easy option, you know. But I don't know where, you go into a cul-de-sac, where do you go? The future is the union. The union opened things up you know, from a closed down world that couldn't see beyond its nose and couldn't see beyond war, it opened up a magnificent landscape of possibility. The only problem with that magnificent landscape of possibility is that when you're living through it, it can be just tedious. You know, the ups and downs and ins and outs and arguments can be tedious, but that's part of what you've got to get through to get it right. Well, um, hopefully we'll all like each other at the end of it. Um, <laughs> When we met, we met uh, and had coffee about a month and a bit ago to prep for this uh, discussion this evening, and I think we spent about an hour and a half in Strawberry Hill House over coffee. So I've had my time with you. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't talk it for my pay. Um, so I've had my time uh, talking to you, and I, I have many other questions I would love to ask you, but I, I realise that this event is mostly... Um, uh, to do with your interaction with uh, staff and students, so, and I'm really just a facilitator for that. Um, so I think maybe if we move uh, to the audience questions and uh, and your answers uh, portion of the evening. Um, that afternoon when we talked in Strawberry Hill House, you said that you wanted a lively discussion. You may regret that. We'd better wake um, everybody up then, right? Grandson. Yeah. I'd wake them up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I presume now the extra mic is creating the feedback, but um, uh, I know that, Emma, you, you have a mic, and I think Sheila has another. No? Is there just the one mic? Okay. Um, so um, if we can take some uh, questions. Uh, what I'll try and do is uh, I'll try and take questions from more or less the same parts of the room, and then we can see if we can move the mic around. Um, but uh, if we can take questions, you're happy enough to take questions yep, from the floor. Yes. Okay. So many thanks for all of that. Obviously not hard questions. Um, there are lo lots of things that we didn't talk about, so uh, please feel free uh, to ask your questions. And when you do, would you mind standing up and saying your name? and your affiliation. So if you're a student here at St. Mary's, tell us what you're studying. If you're a staff member, tell us what you do. And if you're external to St. Mary's, could you please just say where you're from or what your affiliation is, please. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Don't jump over one. <laughs> um, we'll take one over here. Yep. To you. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm external, so I'll start you off and then other people might uh, get brave. Uh, Fiona DeLandres, Professor of Global Legal Studies at the University of Birmingham. So a number of the things that you spoke about uh, in the course of your discussion struck me as sort of suggesting that in Ireland we may have moved into or be moving into a point of post-post-colonialism. Um, so finally reaching this point where we feel confident in being ourselves rather than in not being something else. Um, and I think that that tends or, or seems to me to uh, be happening at more or less the same time as a lot of social movements in Ireland around some things that would have been seen as very quintessentially Irish. And I'm thinking about things like the preamble to the Constitution, the woman's place in the home, the Eighth Amendment, the position of marriage, uh, our language, and so on. I wondered whether you share that view that there is a sort of point, we've reached a point of confidence uh, in that way, and if so, uh, whether you think there is an argument for us trying to encapsulate that in a new form of constitutional identity, or can our current constitution uh, you know, accommodate that uh, new identity? So just a small question to start you off. Not a big one at all. Thank you very much indeed, because I think that question really does point up um, a, a, a current reality. Yes, I do think there is a new confidence. And yes, I think we're looking at the future now, asking very different questions about ourselves and that future. Even words around the concept, for example, of United Ireland and what that might mean. Because coming down the road, someday, there will be a referendum on this issue. Now, in the past, it was perceived to be, well, the North will get swallowed up by the Catholic South, the Protestant North will get swallowed up by the Catholic South. That has eviscerated as even a possibility. Um, and so there's, there are all sorts of new political realignments, um, new sort of political maturities. Some of them, some of them reasonably well developed, some of them still incipient, some of them still, you know, uh, emerging. And I think that out of that, um, you know, like strange, strange phenomena for me, like to see um, um, the, the extraordinary, um, overwhelming endorsement last year of same-sex marriage um, by a, 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 a voting population that for the most part came out of, comes out of the Catholic tradition. And it was sort of, if you like, almost Catholic against Catholic. I know that's a bit of an exaggeration because we do have a very substantial other population in Ireland beyond Catholics. But uh, among the Christ Christian population, the Church of Ireland was broken on this. You know, they were split on it. Um, Catholics were split on it. Um, so here you, uh, here you have a, 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 a really different wave, if you like, going coursing through the body politic. Um, and I think that what we now need to concentrate on is to take that confidence and engage with our colleagues on an all-island basis on where does this take us to in the future? What, and again, what baggage do we need to dispose of on the way to be able to establish the good neighbourly relationships that conduce to reconciliation? For me, I, I'm probably not going to live ever to see United Ireland. A lot of people died thinking they would. Um, and I do still believe very firmly that if the island was organised on an all-island basis, it would be, a, 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 and happily so, um, uh, without a late motif of violence, that again, to go back to the, the, the idea, the heft of partnership, the heave and the heft of partnership would release such um, really good things into the Irish body politic, very taken by the research recently published from the University of British Columbia, which says that in an All-Ireland, if there was an, a, a, a reconciled Ireland tomorrow, if we were organised on an, um, an All-Ireland basis, that over an eight-year period, the benefit to the economies north and south would be almost $40 billion. Um, that that's what the, the level of growth would be. So uh, things like that, I think this is where the debate needs to go to. It needs to go you know, away from wrap the flags, the two flags. You know, it has to get away from union jackery and tricolory into, uh, we're, we're living together now, you know, we're next door neighbours, we're actually getting on okay now. How can we improve on that? How can we build on that? And what things are we doing that will help that building and what things are we thinking and holding on to that are getting in the way of that. So that's a, that's, I think, do you know what? I think we're liberated now to have that debate. I'm not sure that I understand for, you know, the, the full contours of it, but I think we're liberated to have it now. Thank you. Yes, uh, Lance 
that's it. I teach on the... Uh, can you all hear me? I teach on the uh, MA in Irish Studies here. Mary, you mentioned um, a couple of heroes in your conversation. Roger Casement, one, and uh, Sean McBride. Mm. But I'm wondering, for you over the last hundred years, um, I mean, apart from Mary Peters, the Queen, and Mo Molum, <laughs> who are the, uh, the Irish women that stand out for you in, in Anglo-Irish history? Oh, the women in Anglo-Irish history. Interestingly, um, I think one of the stories that, uh, and predictably, is not well known uh, is the story of Irish women and their contribution. If you go back to 1916, the contribution of Common um, uh, the which is the, the women's organization, um, um, completely overlooked for a very long time in the, te the telling of the story. Um, I was part of a, a team that made a documentary on the, the women of the rising. And I was very struck by the story of Elizabeth O'Farrell. Uh, and I think I like the idea of bringing her story back into memory. Um, she was a nurse trained in Hollis Street Hospital, where my two grandchildren have been born. Um, she was um, in the GPO with Pierce. She was there for the surrender. In the iconic photograph of him taking the surrender, you can just see her foot. Um, <laughs> some people suggest that she was deliberately taken out of the photograph, you know, just so that it would be just Pierce, you know, there's, there's the starkness of Pierce. I see more recently Colm Tobin saying that that isn't what happened at all, that actually what happened was that she herself um, did not want a nurse standing in nurse's uniform standing beside Pierce so that he'd look like an invalid and that she herself shifted so that she would be off camera. So, you know, take your pick. I, I think her family support the second view of that. Um, who knows? In any event, um, the truth of the matter is whether she was or was not cut out, actually the story of women is largely cut out. In the same way that the story of women is largely cut out of a lot of aspects of history. And um, I think of, um, of the women during the Rising who took a lot of risks, but were able, incidentally, were able to take those risks precisely because the male soldiers on the street didn't take them seriously. You know, they were able to navigate those kind of spaces um, and take risks, you know, bring messages from one place to another, to, uh, move guns, move ammunition. Uh, and because nobody, th because uh, they were just women, um, they were able to get away with that. So in a sense, the, you know, the cloud of, of um, the cloud of carelessness around women's contribution both helped them at a practical level during the rising, but, sub but subsequently, of course, conspired to keep their memory uh, way in the background. So for me, there are, look, there are many, many, many women. I think of the woman whom I succeeded, Mary Robinson, whose election as a woman, the first woman president of Ireland, was um, you know, a really very important moment for Ireland, really very um, seminal in so many, many ways. I think of, and then after that, you know, I just think of the women like my mother and grandmother, um, whose contributions, um, uh, and there are many people like them, you know, who had very large families. My grandmother had 11 children, my mother had nine. She and her siblings between them have 60 children, because my family thought they had to increase, multiply, fill the earth all by themselves. <laughs> and, um, and very nearly came to succeeding. And um, I think of the women of those generations whose lives were absolutely self-sacrificial. And I think particularly of women in the West, where my other grand, where my uh, paternal grandmother was from, who never knew the joy of seeing their children grow into late teenage. Why? Because they'd all emigrated by the time they were 14, like my father, or 15. And never, ever knew the joy of having your grandchildren romp in and out of your house. The most they got were pictures from America of these kids with fabulous teeth. Um, you know, the American teeth thing. Um, and um, the, the Christmas photographs of fabulous teeth, we used to call them. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so th that was all they got, you know, for these lives of extraordinary faith and sacrifice. And... Um, I think of, uh, they were the backbone, they were the backbone of, of community um, and anything that was really good that was going on in life, anything that was nurturing, anything that was cherishing, they were the holders and keepers of that 
And I like to think that when the, the, I think the proclamation, for example, of 1916 is a very beautiful document. And although we know it was drafted by men, um, nonetheless, I see and hear women's voices through it. The first document of its kind to, uh, to talk about the equality, equal opportunities for all men and women. Um, so that there's the influence of Irish women, because of course the suffragette movement was also ongoing. And then that phenomenal phrase, cherishing the children, that, that, that this new republic would cherish the children of the nation equally. That's a, very, that's, that's a nurturing word. That's a mummy's word, you know, to cherish, isn't it? I mean, it's really soft. It's not, it's not what you get from terrorists, you know, which is how they were regarded, of course, by the British government at the time. I mean, terrorists don't talk about cherishing. And these people were not terrorists. These were people who wanted the freedom of their country, just as America had done when it rose up in the 1700s against British colonial rule. Um, uh, and I mean, I would wish, and everybody would wish that, that Ireland's independence, such as it is, had been got by, you know, just asking, may we please have our country back and being given it. I would have wished that, that would have been as, it would have been as decent as that, but it wasn't. And, and it never is, is it? It never really is. Um, um, so that was how it was. Um, and, and we have to live and accept that, that sad reality. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of women who are in back of that. Um, and then the women who were left to pick up the pieces during the Civil War, after the Civil War. And the women who had ambitions to be all the things they wanted to be, but kept hearing those words, you can't because you're a woman. So I wouldn't want to pick any one of them out, but there are, there are some fabulous women there. Uh, yes, I'm Dermot Kelly. I'm a senior lecturer in the business management program here in the School of Management and Social Sciences. Um, I was just reading an article in the Irish Times over the weekend where uh, your successor, President Michael D. Higgins, was sounding a note of caution um, to universities in Ireland that they be aware of being too focused on churning out um, fodder for the job market. I don't think those were his words, but words that affect that he was uh, cautioning against universities just being creators of graduates and that he was saying that universities needed to inculcate critical thinking and um, you know, creative thinking as well. Do you think from your experience of higher education um, that to what extent would you share his concern about the way, direction that universities are going? Well, he and I, he and I have both worked in universities. I mean, his previous life was as a a university lecturer, my previous life before I became president was the same. And I think all of us who've worked in universities could see exactly where those tensions come from and where that debate comes from. And in a sense, those of us who are, you know, those of us who work in universities, you know, th this is a debate that is our kind of almost sacred stewardship. Um, uh, we, you know, we students come to us, we provide the service. What is the nature of that service? And what is it addressed to? And you know, is it purely functional and market driven? Or is it underpinned by some kind of continuation of their, of their personal formation that they've got from the cradle and from family and from school? Are we implicated in that also? I think we are. I think we should be. Um, because I do think that we have a vested interest in ensuring that the people who leave us as graduates, to the extent that it is possible, leave knowing that we are people who are inspired by value systems that are, that are not just about sums, but actually we're interested in them as people. People who may over the course of a lifetime, they may go into a job tomorrow morning and they may get knocked down by a bus and not be able to work. You know, there might be people who, you know, who achieve the highest um, rank in the business world, or they, they could be people who end up working in middle management, or people whose who's ambitions are frustrated for a whole variety of reasons. We have to be able to give them something when they are here that allows them and helps them to face all that, all that unknown and unknowable with some kind of confidence and some kind of faith that we cared about that while they were here, you know, while they were in our universities. So yes, I, I do think that, um, that focus on the kind of skills and the kind of aptitudes and the kind of ethics that are in back of us as teachers are also very, very important. For example, one of the things that I've always been very worried about is um, that though it's not, a, not an issue here, um, because this place, of course, comes out of a teacher training background, so it's, it understands what teaching is all about. 
You know, it's got a strong, forceful commitment to teaching. But we kind of flipped a few years back, and it was all research, 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 to the point where students would tell you that they would go along to their mentors, their tutors, and be told, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you today, and I've got, I've got this thing to do for the research assessment exercise, you know, or whatever, whatever its name is now, the ref now. Um, you know, I just haven't time anymore. People are being hired on the basis of, uh, exclusively on the basis of their research profile, whether they could teach or not was neither here nor there. Promoted on the basis of their research profile, whether they could teach or not was neither here nor there. Um, and that's not, you know, we, balance is everything, you know, and we, as institutions, universities have to be about both. That research is very important, really, really important. Uh, good research, um, um, not just done for the sake of um, an exercise, but actually research, good focused research, very important, a very important service also to students and to humanity generally. But fundamentally, our, our students, when they come here and pay their fees, are entitled to really good teaching. You know? And I don't know who ever got this mad notion that just because you've got you know, a, you know, a doctorate in biochemistry that you are ipso facto a great teacher. One of the best experiences for me, I have to say, was bringing into the university, Queen's University of Belfast, when I was pro-vice chancellor, our very first ever profoundly deaf from birth student. To our shame, I don't know how true it is elsewhere in the United Kingdom, but to our shame, no profoundly deaf from birth student had ever entered an Irish university. Hard, uh, people who had lost their hearing, maybe through meningitis or who had been deaf end, but nobody who was born deaf and profoundly deaf had ever got into it. They'd never been able to crack the code of English, basically. But anyway, we had a program. This young girl came in. I, because I had the sign language um, and experience of the deaf, I was her so-called mentor. Well, I tell you, she taught me a thing or two. She went through that university like, like a Russian tank heading for the front. And she took no quarter. She just took no quarter. At, at various points, I had to have my door rehung because she attacked it with such venom. You know, this, this, you know, this lecturer you know, has a mustache and you know, I, can't, I can't lip read. Um, you know, this teacher turns to the board when he's talking and so how can anybody hear him? You know, because I can't lip read. And, and suddenly she exposed um, to those of us who thought we were good teachers, little you know, peccadillos that we'd all picked up that were appalling from the point of view of communication. In my own case, I talk too quickly, as she told me repeatedly. And I can't lip read you, talk too quickly. Um, and, um, and so, really with her help, we were able to take a completely new, new look at the whole pedagogy of pedagogy. And it was the best thing ever. It was just the best thing ever. And one of the wonderful things was, she, she chose to study English. I thought she was mad. I just thought she was mad. She studied English, she got a first class honours, she was Scholar of the Year for four years in a row, and then she came out as Student of the Year, and then went on to a Fulbright. Amazing. Just an amazing person. And sometimes we need those kind of amazing people who are also the end users of our product and our service to tell us, you know, you're crap. You know, or you could do it better. Because at the, and, and that's why I love the idea of having, you know, student involvement nowadays, you know, in assessing, student involvement in feedback. You know, all of that is an area. When I was growing up at university, you wouldn't dare offer an opinion on the vice chancellor. Never. <laughs> but it's all good about you, thank God, Francis. But in my day, no, most of us didn't even know his name. You know, who was this person, this remote person? And, and we would certainly never have offered, you know, an opinion on our teachers. Anyway, we, would, we might have among ourselves. We might have muttered among ourselves. But nobody ever asked our opinion, because it wasn't like the women's thing. We weren't worthy of consideration. You know, we were just there to, you know, to turn up. And, um, and I think that the respect that is now shown um, to, the, to the students' views is extraordinarily important. And to listen to that and to feed it in. And it, it does take a certain amount of hum humility on the part of, you know, those of us being university teachers to accept that there are things that, that we just need to, you know, we need to scale up on. And um, so I think that those are the kinds of things and the issues that, um, that I think President Higgins was right to draw attention to. It's, you know, I think we're all, anybody who's involved in university life, that's what we're talking about these days. I personally hate this whole, you know, I hate this whole... Um, stepladder thing, you know, 
um, you know, where universities are ranked and rated, and we don't know who the ranking organisations are, and we don't know what their agendas are. Um, I, qu I quite like the one from the European Commission. I think it's a broader one. It includes teaching as well as research. Um, I don't like the way universities that have loads of money always seem to come out on top. Um, that bothers me greatly. And um, so I think there, yeah, there are things we should be, you know, we should be really engaged with as teachers in universities. Thank you. Um, this gentleman here in the green sweater, and then we'll have another hand over there. We might. Um, I'm Michael McDonough. Um, I write for the Irish World, but I, um, I'm hoping to be an MA student here uh, in September. Um, I'm a little older than you, Mary, so I was uh, actually lucky enough to have been at the Easter Rising celebrations 50 years ago in 1966. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, no, 66. And 66. 66. Right? Yeah, 66. And, um, How was that? Yeah. In I, as you said, it was very triumphalist then. And I thought that the... I was there this year and I thought that it was wonderful how the, the history, the nuanced narrative of history had been presented by the government. But one of the highlights for me was seeing you sitting next to Mary Robinson and Martin McGuinness and seeing Martin McGuinness applauding the prison officers band and the, <laughs> and the, and the Garda band. Um, and I wondered, you know, I'm not going to be there in 50 years, but I wondered uh, where we'll be in 50 years of that similar celebration and will the head of the Northern Ireland administration be there and possibly maybe even uh, Prince William or, or his progeny? Well, I, I, don't, I won't be there either, I'm sure, in 50 years' time. But um, so, at least I hope I won't be there in 50 years' time. Even this, it's a whole business of elongating life really worries me. Um, but anyway, um, so I don't... Well, I, there are just the most extraordinary things have <laughs> happened. I mean, at, I was in Belfast for the 1966 commemorations, which were conducted in a very hostile environment. You might remember it was the start of the Reverend Dr. Ian Paisley um, um, coming on the scene with that kind of demagogic um, sectarian language. Um, if you remember, you know, there was the attack on the Sinn Féin offices, the bottom of the Falls Road, where they took the tricolour out and all of that. So all of that stuff. Um, my, I was on the Falls Road the day of the 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 the, the, um, the day of the parade. It was um, uh, my cousin's husband actually, who was an old IRA uh, former internee. He was he led the parade, and um, and I still remember my my grand aunt. Uh, we were upstairs watching from the window of her home. She lived in the front of the Falls Road. And my father was downstairs uh, at the front of the, uh, watching the parade when a gentleman sidled up to him and started talking to him and my aunt nearly having hysterics because the man in question was a special branch officer, a Catholic special branch officer. My mother, my, my, grand, my grand aunt was afraid that somebody might do something and my father's closeness to him would result in him being caught up in it. So th those were the tensions. And of course, very quickly, it descended then into the Troubles. This is 66, descended into the, the maelstrom of the Troubles. I mean, the contrast, the contrast with 2016 couldn't be more. And Martin McGuinness is an interesting case in point, because if I go back to the Queen's visit in 2011, nothing on this planet would induce Sinn Féin to have anything to do with the visit. And I know because I tried everything. I tried everything, including a per, you know, personal private meetings with them, and all of it didn't work. And even to the point of we keeping seats for them at dinner and lunch tables to the right last moment in the hope that they would change their minds as the, you know, as the trip, uh, as the visit caught the public imagination, didn't work. So they would have nothing to do with it, and they instructed everybody belonging to them, and particularly all their public representatives, to have nothing to do with it. And bear in mind, none of them had had a handshake from the Queen or offered her their hand and handshake up to that point. So, anyway, the, the event went off. But on the third day, the visit was a four-day visit, and, um, which is long for a state visit. Our normal state visits are three days, but we had deliberately, you know, as a token of investment and faith in this, it was a four-day visit. On the third day, the Queen visited a place called Cashel in County Tipperary. And by God's good grace... The mayor of Cashel was a Sinn Féin mayor who had been instructed by his party not to attend and not to meet the Queen. And on the third day, out of the blue, he decided, damn it, I'm going to meet her. And he did. Now, he was dying of cancer at the time. And he announced publicly that he would meet her because he was the mayor of Cashel. And he represented all the people of Cashel. And he wasn't going to be told by anybody not to meet her. So he did. And that kind of left Sinn Féin 
in a bit of a, they were, well, they were in a bit of a difficulty now, to put it as mildest. But in fairness to Jerry Adams, he issued a number of statements during the week of the visit. You know, he complimented the Queen on her speech, for example, in Dublin Castle. So they were making soothing noises. And it showed me that they just were not in a place, and we've had to be patient with this, because we've had to be patient with a lot of other people as well. They weren't in a place leading up to the visit with their constituency. They were not in a place to come to the official commemorate or the official visit events. Um, there was a small protest at the Garden of Remembrance. I could have organized a better protest. You know, a bunch of fellas, you know, with signs saying Brits out wearing Manchester United t-shirts. They were <laughs> complete embarrassment now. Just an embarrassment. It's kind of like, you know, <coughs> could something not organize a decent protest? I mean, one that actually holds together. You know, the dots are joined up. Anyway, there wasn't a dot joined up anywhere, but it was actually pathetic. And because it was pathetic, they were kind of embarrassed by it. So with the result that very shortly after the, um, the Queen's visit, Martin McGuinness met her in Northern Ireland and shook her hand. So that was that. I then went on the return visit that President Higgins made, and I was at the Windsor dinner. And who was at the dinner? Martin McGuinness. So you see, you know, it's like leading out into the deep. Somebody has to lead out into the deep and stand there and shout back to the rest of them, it's okay, you're not going to drown. My feet are on the ground. And encourage people then to move out into the deep. And there's been a lot of that happening. I think the next 50 years, we'll see a lot more of that and a lot more steps taken between north and south into that place that is the deep or across the bridges that are being built. Uh, which I hope will not be tested by a Brexit, because they most surely would be. Um, and things that are going well would be unnecessarily put at risk. Um, things that are going very smoothly because of the overarching membership of the European Union. So I'm hoping that we will still be members of the European Union, that the trade between North and South, which has grown exponentially in recent years since the Good Friday Agreement, which incidentally, when 1998, when I, 1997 when I came into office, the land border in the European Union with the least commerce across it was the land border in Ireland. Like utterly stupid, utterly stupid. The nearest people to you to sell stuff to are your neighbours. I mean, why would you transport it 400 miles when you can transport it four miles? I mean, so stupid you wouldn't believe it. But you know, we were all playing the old vanity games and along came the Good Friday Agreement and the yesness and the common purpose now in the future, and that all evaporated. And now we have really substantial trade, really substantial tourism. We have a vested interest in each other's co economies doing really well. We have inter-trade Ireland. We have a common tourism body. You know, really good stuff. Now, these are all, to some extent, you could argue, quite embryonic. They're still all in startup mode. But already they are producing the goods. In 50 years' time, I don't know what they'll have produced, but if they've been able to sustain the momentum without the cataclysmic um, effects of a Brexit, then I think we are looking at, we're looking at the, stabilize, the, the complete stabilization of peace and, please God, mutual prosperity. And out of that comes a generation that hasn't the hang-ups that my generation and past generations have, because they'll have grown up with peace and prosperity and good neighborliness. Thanks. Um, I'm mindful of the time, and I'm not sure how generous you all are with the idea of staying on a little bit later than we had anticipated. I'm worried about the fellows in the bar. They might get a little bit um, over-exuberant with the, the wine. But um, if you'll permit me... That would never happen to Irish people, let me tell you. <laughs> we, okay, we okay That's to go for another 20, 15 minutes? Do yeah, sure. Got I'll put it, yeah, some water like, there yes, if you'd like yeah. to... Uh, uh, take a sip. Um, but I have three hands up. I've Carol and Ryan, and a hand went up over here, Samantha. If, maybe if we could take those three questions one after the other. Should we try yeah, that? I'll, I'll try and remember and them. Try and, I'll try remember and remember them. Yeah. them. Um, so I'll just in the order that the hands went up. Go over here first. Hello, um, Carol Murphy. I'm a lecturer in sociology and criminology here. And um, I was really interested in what you were talking about in terms of Brexit, and you just brought it up there again. And one of the things that you've said a number of times is this idea of getting on with your neighbours. And it's interesting that it, this is happening in the UK at the time, because the kind of discourses that underpin it are, seem to be about anti-immigration and anti-other, 
and seem to be about closing the border. And so my question to you really is, um, you're obviously very clear that Brexit would be dangerous, and I agree with you as it happens, but my question is, what do you think can be done to kind of change those narratives and to um, instigate a kind of different narrative based on the idea of getting on with your neighbours because it's really important, it seems, to change the, those discourses at the moment. So while you think about that, the microphone's going to go over to Ryan over there. Okay. Right in front of the light, yeah. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, my name is Ryan Jones. Uh, I'm current, a recent graduate of St Mary's, former student union president. Uh, my question just is, you talked recently about building bridges uh, earlier, and my question is just how important, in your opinion, is the role of sport in building bridges? And I refer to the 2007 Six Nations game between Ireland and England in Croke Park. Two very different questions. I will definitely remember that what, question. Yes. <laughs> I may not answer it, but I remember it. Hi, my name's Samantha. I'm a, an undergraduate student. I know I might not look it, but I still am. <laughs> um, I'm refer I've just come back from Belfast actually yesterday, and I was interviewing um, a, a, a B special police officer. Um, for a, an exhibition piece coming up. And my question really is, is how is the police force in Northern Ireland integrating now? Because they've always had such a terrible reputation. How, how is that coming together now in Northern Ireland? Okay, my gosh, that's a, that's a fair, from Brexit to be specials, wow. Uh, with, with rugby thrown in. Mm. I think, was, well, Brexit. Um, take the, the, what I would call the, 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 the um, the neuralgic issues. Uh, I think we need champions who are prepared to argue the opposite. To the fears, um, um, particularly where those fears are um, addressable, you know, statistically addressable. Um, frankly, I think the whole issue of immigration is much better dealt with on a European basis um, than on a, an isolated basis. I can't see for the life of me why you would want to do it uh, why you'd want to cope with these pressures, because these are pressures that are going to be constant. Um, if it isn't a war, it's economic migrants. Um, the differences as we, and, and the ease of access now in terms of well, thinking of the poor people for, who don't have ease of access, who are coming across s dangerous seas and putting their lives at risk, telling us something about how important escape is. Um, look, you know, we live in a world that can be pitched into turmoil it could be us. I know this because in 1969, you know, my family had to pick up and flee and we didn't know if we'd ever get back to our home. We did get back to our home. A few years later, people came with machine guns and emptied them in through our windows and we never got back to that home. We walked out with what the clothes we stood up in and we never went back to that home again. And for uh, the nine kids were farmed out all over the place. It was months before we were re reunited in one home. So I know think stuff happens. And, um, and because it happens, we never are really able to indulge in the, the vanity of thinking, never us, we'll never be that migrant, you know. And many of us, uh, you know, have history, particularly the Irish, we have a history of being migrants, we have a great should have a great sensitivity to it. And I'd like to think that in this country that there are enough people who are able to engage in the debate and insist on the values of decency being employed in that debate and not the values of fear or worse than that, you know, of racism or phobias that are really inimical to, to decent living. And they are not the hallmark of democracies. Um, so that's, I think, really good champions uh, is very, very important. That's, so I think we're in, a, in for, and I also think this campaign is way too long, you know, it's just, and, and because it's long, the danger is people will just lose interest. But really, we need champions. And I don't mean necessarily public. I, some, of the, some of the most important interventions are around the family table, are in the workplace, are in the club, are among friends, because people's points of view often shock us and surprise us. And I think that is to, to be the person who's not silent. When you hear the jarring, when a friend says the thing that jars, the temptation is to say, oh God, I'll say nothing, I don't want to fall out. 
But I think it's better to say, I don't want to fall out with you, but here's what I think about that. Actually, I disagree with you. I think if you take that, that view to its logical conclusion, you would create a world of castes. And we're way beyond that. We're an egalitarian democracy. It's fought very hard to be an egalitarian democracy. We're in an inclusive place, a place where people aren't migrants. They're actually people. They're human beings. You know, so that's important, I would say. And the more people who do that during these coming weeks, the better. Um, yes, 2007, remind me of that day. <laughs> what was it about that day in your mind that really sticks out? It was the England's first return to Croke Park since 1920, yes. on the 20th of November. It was absolutely mighty. Does everybody know what happened on that day? No? Some people do, yes. What happened was the, the Aviva, the, what is now the Aviva Rugby Stadium um, was under reconstruction and a deal had been done with the Gaelic Athletic Association, um, the custodians of Ireland's native games, um, who had generously made their pitch available to both soccer and rugby. And it was the first time that rugby well, not so much rugby, because actually it wasn't the first time that rugby was played on it, because the first match was with the French. So the first, the first time rugby was played on Croke Park, we heard the Marseillaise, right? So that was important. The second time rugby was played was Ireland against England, and we had, um, then we had the, the British National Anthem played for the first time on Croke Park. It was played on a pitch which, um, uh, well, right in, fr um, um, in front of the, the main stadium is called after a man who was murdered in 1920, in November of 1920, when British troops um, rolled in tanks onto the pitch during a match, opened fire, killed 14 people, I think injured about 60 others, and one of the people who was killed was a player uh, called Michael Hogan, after whom the famous Hogan stand is called. So, that's um, the... I, uh, I walked along the pitch that day, uh, shook hands with all the rugby players, and what I said to each one of them was, today is the day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to anybody who's an English rugby fan. Doesn't happen often, but we completely emulsified them. Play Sorry, Rod. Because Rod and I go to the rugby matches together, but sorry. But we actually played you off the pitch that day. And I think psychology may have played a part in it, because uh, we, you know, we were hoping that you'd be scared stiff. And, um, but I have to say, one of the most beautiful things about that day, um, because it, it wasn't just a day of, of old rivalries, it was also a day of new respect. Because when the, when the British National Anthem was played, there was every possibility in a crowd of 82,000 people that some plunker would say something you know, untoward or roar something and, and in that environment, it would have been heard. But the silence for the, and the respect for the anthem was absolutely wonderful. It then, of course, was followed by an absolutely thunderous version of the Irish national anthem, sung in such a way that I've never heard it before. Um, so um, it was an extraordinary day. And um, again, it was a bridge building day too, because even though the British lost, or the big one, the English lost that day, um, you know, we, 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 had a, we had a very good sporting day. And it was more than sporting. You know, it, it dug deep down into that space where sometimes bitterness of a political nature lurks, and it helped it to leach away. And that was very good. Um, and then, the B specials. Mm. Well, let me just, to start back the back end of that, we have a, a police force now called the Police Service of Northern Ireland, which is a community-based police force, which when it was founded um, was designed to ensure that the traditional or the historic absence of Catholics uh, from the police force would be addressed. They addressed that very forcefully. Um, that police force is, in my view now, a community police force that enjoys the support of all sides of the community. Its predecessor, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, did not enjoy that because about 6% of the Royal Ulster Constabulary were Catholics. It was essentially, a, you know, it was, it was part of the, that administrative apparatus uh, that was a Protestant state for Protestant people. Um, but it morphed into the PSNI, which I think is an, ext you know, it's, uh, that itself, that culture change to me, um, and the willingness to engage in that culture change was evidence of the yesness 
in people, because that was a very big move. Quite a number of members of the RUC, of course, took the opportunity to retire, but many more stayed on to assist the new police force to become a shared community uh, police force, which is what it now is. The B specials are a different order of magnitude. They were an auxiliary force. Not always the best disciplined, it has to be said. And I have to say, on, in, in August of 1969, and I had this discussion lately with a good old friend of mine and former teacher, David Trimble, and he and I would hold uh, different views on politics, obviously, but um, I'm glad that we have a great friendship and the height of respect for one another. But I was able to tell him that on August 14th, 1969, I was coming home from dinner. Uh, I'd been invited to dinner by our parish priest, myself and another girl, because we had just got into university and we were both the first in our families to get to university. This was the priest, incidentally, who told me when I was 14 I could never be a lawyer because I was a woman. Uh, but he'd reviewed his, reviewed his position in the four years in the interim um, and um, very kindly invited me out to dinner. As an aside, I should say, his name was Phelan Kelly. He was an uncle of a man called Frank Kelly who's just died. Some of you will know him better as Father Ted. Father Ted, I beg your pardon, Father Jack, not Ted, Jack. And Father Jack was based on the man who took me out to dinner that night. So, it was a great dinner, fantastic dinner. And uh, we arrived back into our parish to discover uh, men with hurley sticks and marbles. And they were throwing the marbles against the granite wall of the chapel to try and simulate gunfire. Why? Because a loyalist mob had come up the main road and it, supported by, regrettably, members of the, in uniform of the B-Specials. And they were, the B-Specials themselves were not firing Catholic houses or setting fire to them, but they were pointing out the houses that required to be set fire to. And we spent the rest of that night helping to rescue um, Catholic friends, gathering up clothes for people who'd nothing, who had, had to flee their homes. So that was the night that I had discovered. I was going to go to university to study law, and here I am in a city that's becoming lawless. But I was very fortunate that I grew up in a home where the great hero in my father's home, in our home, was Daniel O'Connell. My father firmly believed um, in the, though he was an old Republican, but he believed in the constitutional way of doing things. He believed in using your voice, using your education, using your powers of persuasion, using whatever was a tool was available to you on the right side of nonviolence. And so I, on that night, I know that many of my young male peers were drawn into, there was no IRA. In fact, there was a big sign went up the next day saying IRA, I ran away. Um, and um, there was no IRA at that time. But there subsequently was an IRA that grew out of that anger. And I've always said, you know, there but for the grace of God, go I. And again, it was one of the benefits of being a woman or being a girl that nobody would even be, th you know, think of attempting to recruit you, at least at, th at that stage um, where I was. Nobody ever offered to recruit me, thankfully. Um, so I never had to make that decision. And uh, so that was, you know, um, a very interesting experience that has always stood with me. Um, and I'm very glad that on that night, um, I chose the law despite um, the evidence that the law belonged to the other. But that too changed. And I think we have a fabulous, absolutely fabulous judiciary now in Northern Ireland, second to none anywhere and um, they are doing a, an absolutely superb job, and they are drawn from right across the community, uh, people of all backgrounds and persuasions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think this might be the last question, actually, sir. Right. So. My name is Pat um, Just hang on for a second until the microphone reaches you. Sorry. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pat Gormley, um, and I'm uh, studying healthcare chaplaincy here at the university, retired for, as a, one of our Majesty's inspectors. But probably the same road that Mary was going up and down that night, I was going up and down that road as well. And I think that one of the things which I think you've said today and tonight is that the whole thing about peace and reconciliation in Belfast is still a long way to go. 
and I think that people like Baroness Blood, who at one time I wouldn't have given house room to, is a really, really great, great advocate of that. And c since coming to London, like, what, 40 odd years ago, uh, now retired, but joined an organization called the Irish Pensioners Choir, which, believe it or not, bring pensioners together from north and south of the border. And it is actually quite amazing the misunderstandings that people in their 60s and 70s have of each other. But when I went to the Irish Embassy the other week and it was a young choir from Belfast from both sides of the divide, that they actually more or less could stand and say what actually was happening in Northern Ireland in terms of education, in terms of trusting each other, and I think that's the future. I think education has played a major role in that. I don't think it's any accident that the peace process gathers momentum uh, with, and the wind at its back is the generation that came out of you know, the, 19, the, 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 the 1940s, the Education Act, free second level education leading on to free third level education, leading on to the massification of third level education in Northern Ireland so that it wasn't any longer the privileged caste elite uh, but rather, you know, the likes of the... Well, Seamus, Seamus Heaney put it brilliantly in the, uh, in the, from, the, from the Canton of Expectation when he talks about the lives that might have, you know, uh, while the, 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 the heads that might have wiled their lives away against the, flank, the, the flanks of milking cows. They were now penciling and paving these new quadrangles of grammar and they were, as he describes them, intelligence as brightened and unmannerly as crowbars. And those, what he was really saying was, just in the same way as he did with the poem, digging, I'll dig with this, meaning the pen, it's very much in the O'Connellite tradition. Use the intellect, and bearing in mind that, of course, O'Connell was highly educated, a barrister, very unusual in the Catholic community at the, at the turn of the um, 19th century. So that... that um, that massification of brain power and the galvanizing of brain power is really paying off now two, three generations down. You've, you've, it goes back to a question of confidence too. I mean, education does gather confidence. And this generation now, um, you know, they, they are a different ball game. My, my mother and father left school at 14 and 15, respect, or uh, backwards, my father left school at 14, my mum at 15. And I would say they lived in the shadow. Anybody who got an education, they would have been slightly in awe of. And that diminishes you somewhat in terms of your confidence and your ability to contribute or to argue your case or stand your ground. So I think the forces of the 1960s and the sectarian forces rather overwhelmed that generation who are a little bit older now. Um, they don't overwhelm the new generation. They, they're pretty problem solving. And that's, their, that's one of the skills hopefully they've learned at university maybe, is to be problem solvers. And, to th and importantly, to think of themselves as problem solvers. When I was growing up, books were things that other people wrote. You know, you read books that writers wrote, but you never thought you'd become a writer. Um, now we empower our young people to think, well, you know, that the next chapter will be written by you, the next books will be written by you, the next politics, the next history. You're the authors of it. Get on with it. And that's, I think, the big difference, in, in, particularly in Northern Ireland today. People will stand their ground in a different way from the past. You know, they'll stand their ground and say, come on, let's, let's sort this. Let's solve this. And that's, I, I, and I think, you know, in this educational establishment, where so many of the teachers who I grew up with went through, um, went through St. Mary's, came back and brought, put their charism and their skill at the service of teaching in Northern Ireland, um, and Ireland generally, it was that investment that helped us to get to this far out into the deep. Well, that's a wonderful note to finish on, I think. Um, so, again, my thanks to you uh, for taking the time to do my all pleasure. of this. Thank you very much um, indeed for staying we also, awake. We also have um, um, Ryan Dowsett from the SU, who's going to make a presentation on behalf of the students. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor McAleese and Dr. McEnany. Get out there. I am sure I speak for everyone when I say that that was a fascinating talk. Uh, and on behalf of the student body, I'd like to give Professor McAleese uh, a token of our appreciation. Some lovely flowers. Um, 
from speaking to fellow students, I'd like, um, especially those who hail from Ireland, uh, Mary's presence here on campus is a real source of pride, uh, particularly when you sent the, uh, the good luck messages to the GAA teams in their championships. <laughs> Let's not mention that. I just bit. have to um, up the passion the next time. Maybe next year. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to incite the next time. That was much too polite, I think. Um, I'm sure it will inspire others to choose to study here at St Mary's and contribute towards Professor McAleese's vision of the Irish playing a full role in the shaping of Britain's future. Uh, I'm sure you will serve as an inspiration to many of us and engage in poli politics and to serve our societies. It's fantastic that you've taken the time to speak to students and given us the benefit of your tremendous wisdom and experience. We truly appreciate it. I'd also like to thank Dr. Dr. McEnany uh, for your time and... Um, Unfortunately, she wouldn't like the flowers this time. Uh, but again, thank you very much, and thanks nice. on behalf of everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for you. Thank you, William. Can I thank all the people who prepared the room for us? You've no idea the amount of effort that went into this. Um, I'm looking at the co-conspirators here. Um, uh, I'm looking in particular here at Marion and Sheena and, well, Emma has disappeared, but the people who, and, and indeed our, our sound uh, uh, crew at the back can, and who did a really good job in just making us feel so comfortable here. Thanks a million. And all of you for the questions and for the interest and, of course, my interrogator, who was very benign, very benign. <laughs>